the farmers out here are families, are people. Some of the big farmers out here still, you know, they'll still be family owned and operated yeah. for generations, but they're now they're huge, but they're still a family at the core of that, you know. We're people. We are, I mean, some of us are city people that made it out yeah. here and, and stayed. This is the Real Food, Real People podcast. Do you know if your family has any farming roots in your background? Bernadette Gagné didn't until she was in Prosser learning all about wine grapes and farming and research and science at the WSU research station there when she found out she had farming roots in that very community. She shares her story, how important it is to her, even though she grew up in a totally different life, not connected with farming at all, and how she's embraced the farming community, what she's learned about family farms here in Washington State, and the importance of all the science and the research that goes into growing wine grapes and continually growing them better and better with better techniques more and more sustainably all the time that's what she's focused on great conversation again at the WSU research station where we talk with Bernadette Gagné in Prosser our sponsors here on the podcast are Mana Insurance Group manainsurancegroup.com is their website and they are focused on protecting your financial future in a way that looks ahead doesn't look backward to just solve problems when they happen. Certainly they do that, but they're about having a plan in advance to make sure that you are taken care of. Again, manainsurancegroup.com. Check them out and thank them for sponsoring this podcast. Also, Dairy Farmers of Washington, generously supporting uh, this podcast, the Real Food, Real People podcast. Um, and they are all about what we're all about, is sharing the real stories of the food and the people behind the food here in Washington State, particularly, of course, Dairy Farms. Wadairy.org is their website site. You should check it out. Uh, and if you haven't yet, I've been talking about this for a long time, check out their virtual farm tour. I know a lot of work went in that to capture the real essence of what life is like on a Washington state dairy farm, what the farmers think, do, how they manage their animals, how they produce milk, how they're sustainable. And you could see it up close and personal in their virtual farm tour, again, at wadairy.org. And then finally, don't forget that we live here in Washington, in the Pacific Northwest, we live in earthquake country. And we hear about, you know, someday, when could it be? Could it be uh, today, tomorrow, next week, next year? We don't know. The big one, though, could be coming. And there are lots of smaller earthquakes all the time here. Are you prepared? Do you know what you would do? in the event of an earthquake. Well, coming up this week is the great Washington Shakeout. Shakeout.org slash Washington is the website. Go check it out and find out what you are supposed to do. There's a lot to it. The first thing, the most important thing you need to remember is drop, cover, and hold on. It used to be just drop and cover, but that hold on part is important too. Uh, if you're under something to protect yourself because in the event of an earthquake, Scary stuff, but things will be moving around. Things will be falling, and you need to hang on as you drop and cover under, under something to protect you from any falling debris. There's so much more, though, to be prepared for an earthquake here in Washington. Again, go to the Great Washington Shakeout page at shakeout.org slash Washington and be prepared for the big drill that's coming up again this week on October 21st at 10:21 in the morning. So 10:21 is the date, October 21st, and 10:21 a.m. is the time when it's happening. Be prepared in advance for this drill so you can get the most out of it at shakeout.org/washington. This is the Real Food Real People podcast. I'm Dylan Honkoop, and this is documenting my journeys all over Washington state to get to know the real people behind our food here in Washington. So you aren't a farmer, like you're a student and a researcher, right? Correct. But you're yes. still kind of a farmer. Yeah, absolutely. That about nails it. So what do you do? Explain. Okay, well, I am a graduate student at Washington State University. I am currently on the Prosser campus, so it's the Irrigated Agriculture Research Extension Center. Um, and I'll spend my duration of my grad school life out here. Yeah. Um so I am kind of the behind the scenes for 
um, improving or coming up with different ideas that farmers can use, hopefully in the very near future. So I sometimes we drive tractors still. Sometimes I weed whack way more than I should. <laughs> um, I work with a machine that was built in like the 40s that used to be in potato research. And now I'm working on it in grapevines. Um, so, yeah, all of my research is and my studies is all geared towards kind of creating new or different or um, just different techniques for farmers to use in the near future. And my focus is all in wine grape systems. So, like, what kind of things are you researching yeah. with wine grapes? All right. Um, so, I am working in alternative strategies for nematode management in wine grape systems. That's, like, my professional title of what I'm working with. Um, so, bugs. Yeah. And yeah. I know about nematodes because I grew up on a raspberry farm. That was an issue. I know they're bugs, like, in the soil, on mm -hmm. the roots of plants, and they're, like, microscopic. Yes. That's yep. about the extent of what I know. Yeah, and a lot of people are like, oh, well, can't you just, like, buy them at the hardware store or something? <laughs> aren't they aren't there good nematodes? And, yeah, there's a lot of good nematodes, but the economic problem is with bad nematodes, and they affect a ton of different crops. Um, and so I work with ways to kind of replace some of the chemical, the traditional chemical options we had for managing those plant parasitic nematodes in wine grape systems. I'm working with ways that we can manage those with plants instead of chemicals. Mm. So I have um, a fumigation replacement I'm working with. I have a nematicide replacement I'm working with. And so these are all plants that hopefully in the near future can kind of take the place of some of those traditional management practices for them. Basically to what? Move growing wine grapes more in the direction of organic almost? Yeah, organic. Um, just sustainability just a few more options for the for a toolbox there like you know maybe you're you just don't have a system that's conducive to applying um some of these chemicals you know like if you're not so much in washington um maybe western washington but if you're like dryland farming and you don't have irrigation set up you know applying a nematicide through a drip emitter isn't really your option but you could plant certain cover crops that could control some of the nematodes and actively growing vineyards and then for a fumigation replacement that can be really expensive sometimes you can use the trellis system that's in place sometimes you have to come out with like big tarps and tarp things down and apply a lot of chemicals this is maybe just something you could seed and not worry about it for yeah. a year so just yeah. a few more options available to people um so that they're not locked into like okay well chemical management is really the only option right now so it's kind of reminding me of some of the stuff that we talked about with bug scientist, a.k.a. entomologist Rebecca Schmidt with mm -hmm. ARS over yeah. in Wampato a while back this season uh -huh. about she's like doing bug battles, like good bugs versus bad yeah. bugs. So are you using other bugs? It sounds like you're using other plants, too, to like go after the bad bugs. Right. So it actually indirectly is kind of a little bit of both. So when you mm. use um, fumigation, that's broad spectrum. So you're going to eliminate a lot of the good and a lot of the bad. Nothing. So fumigation is like putting chemical in the soil. Yep. Yeah. Pesticides. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. So yeah, it's usually a chemical injection in the soil um, and it's going to um, eradicate is probably not the accurate word to use there because you can't get rid of everything a hundred percent in the soil. Um, yeah. But it's going to like greatly reduce the pest population as well as the beneficial um, insect fungi community, you know, bacterial community, it's going to like greatly reduce the whole, uh, the whole community there. So we're working with something that will reduce just the plant parasitic nematodes and not some of those good guys. So it is indirectly a little bit of, yeah, using plants to help plants and also not getting rid of the good guys and just targeting yeah. the bad guys. So you're not wiping out everything. It's kind of like, an antibiotic, like if you think of antibiotics yeah, for, yeah. you know, humans, like, okay, that wipes out a lot of good and bad. We're looking at something that will just target the bad and leave some of the good. So, because we can't get rid of everything, but maybe we'll give the good a better chance of fighting off and keeping that pest pressure lower. So, so we keep hearing about soil health. It's like, yeah. even like people who aren't farmers are starting to think about this, mm -hmm. you know, and, and there's so many reasons why, like, 
carbon sequestration and, you know, healthy systems and good food and all of that. It sounds like that's a big part of what you're up to because you're all like soil bugs. You aren't like bugs that are on the foliage. Yeah, of everything. Grapes. Yeah, everything. Soil scientists are going to be mad, but I, because I am, uh, I'm getting a degree in horticulture, not soil science. So yeah. I say dirt more than I probably <laughs> should. Um, but yeah, I say to people all the time, yeah, I'm in the dirt more than I'm actually in the vines, but yeah. it's all for wine grape systems. So right. yeah, the soil health component is really big, which is why, you know, we're looking at um, processes, systems, and techniques that don't, you know, well, that don't have such a drastic effect on kind of uh, reducing some of the soil health that's existing in those systems. So we don't want to exacerbate a problem while we're trying to fix it. It's right. kind of like, okay, what can we do to add to the soil health and have a little gentler approach to it? Yeah. And from what you described earlier, it's like really practical kind of stuff too, not like super yeah. heady. It's about like, what can we do that's actually workable for a farmer to use? Absolutely. Yeah. My, I have one of the most applied degrees that I've ever seen. You know, there's very little time spent in a lab and a lot of time spent outdoors. And like I said, I'm weed whacking. I'm, I've, we've gone out there and we've hat hand weeded a bunch of our research plots. We, I mean, the time. The hours I've spent hoeing some of these too. Um, so yeah, it's and that is all on a research scale. Like for commercial production, I don't think we're going to be out there hand weaving. But for now, yeah. to establish, do these processes work? Um, yeah, it's really applied. It's it's not like a big, sciencey, scary, intimidating project I'm working on. It's something that's really applied. So that way, hopefully, it can have a quicker turnaround and be available to farmers. I mean, even some of this can be done by people like backyard farmers, you know, um, people who just have a small backyard and they're wanting to do something good for the soil that could maybe help them out a little bit with whatever they're growing in their backyard. Like these are all things that are really applied and can be hopefully easily transferred to just the yeah. regular farmer, regular human so for the person who likes to drink wine, and there's getting to be more and more of those, myself oh, yeah. included, yeah. and Washington wine, people are discovering how amazing it is. It is, yes. And those are the farmers, the wine grape growers that you are helping mm -hmm. nematodes and what you're talking about to do, you know, to control them. Yeah. What difference does that make to the wine that I drink? To them? Okay, so nematodes, they're... There's, like I said, good and bad. There's a plant parasitic nematode in Washington State called Melodogyne hapla. It's the northern root Wait, knot nematode. Mo, mo, what? Mo, I know. <laughs> you got to say that I said that so quickly, and I need to <laughs> slow down. So that's Melodogyne hapla, but it's the northern root knot nematode. Melodogyne okay. hapla is a scientific name that I'm just used to saying in papers and, <laughs> yeah, presentations and all sorts of things. Oh, you're a researcher. Yeah. I'll give you a pass. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So the northern root knot nematode. So this affects more than just grapes, but my focus yeah. is in wine grapes. So it causes almost like a root cell, like plant cancer. Um. Mm. It establishes, um, it in its juvenile form, it can move throughout the soil until it finds a, like a root host that it really likes. And then it can establish a reproduction site there. And it actually will get into the root tip. And once it finds a cell it likes, then it creates like this big giant cell where they merge and cell walls kind of disintegrate. And that big giant cell then blows up. And that's where like the plant cancer kind of aspect comes in where it's like root cell plant cancer. And it mm -hmm. restricts the um, intake and circulation of water and nutrients to the rest of the plant. So it makes it really hard for new vines to get established. And then you'll just see overall vine decline, which like some people are like, oh, well, maybe we're deficient in some nutrients or maybe it's water stress. Well, if you look below the surface, it yeah. could actually be, you know, a soil borne pest issue caused by heavy populations of root knot nematode. So that's how it can affect. So it can like either keep grape vines from growing up yeah really yep. or it can attack older ones and mm -hmm. like slowly kill them yep yeah you'll just have you know you'll start to see a reduced fruit set you'll start to see reduced fruit yield and quality like colors all sorts of things anything that could like add to grape um 
development, like great berry development, Mm -hmm. that all has to come from somewhere. And a lot of that comes from the roots. And if it can't get past the roots, then, you know, it's not going to make it into the berry. Yeah, we talked with Carrie Shields about terroir or yeah, However, the terroir. Terroir. Yes. With, with, don't <laughs> get close. me on French no, pronunciation. I'm terrible with it. But, you know, how important the soil and the place and all of that is. Soil being certainly a big element, not mm-hmm. the whole thing. But if what the plant is getting from the soil changes, that probably, I would assume, changes the flavor of the wine. Yeah. Reduces the... You know, some of those desirable factors that yeah. you look for in a grape. Yeah, absolutely. And overall production, too. You're just getting less of it. Yep. Not a good thing. This is not help. Yeah. N- nematodes are not helping my wine. They are not. There are some good ones that attack the bad ones. Yeah. And so I don't want to just be like, they're all bad. <laughs> there are good ones that attack the bad ones. And those are good. I mean, nice. they're, they're, ben- they're called beneficial nematodes. Um, but the economic issue is definitely with those plant parasitic ones. So, so they're like microscopic. Yeah. But you have microscopes. Yep. What what do they look like? Uh, so it's actually just like uh, a light microscope that you would see in pretty much your basic chemistry class um, there or chemistry lab. So they're like, they're not super, super tiny. No, uh-uh. I can look at them through like 10 times, 22 times. And I'm like, okay, wait, I got to check this out a little bit more. I can crank it up to a big 40X, but I'm not looking at anything crazy here. You know, it's, if I break it, I will probably get in trouble, but I'm not, it's not going to be the end of my grad school career if I break this. Like like an electron microscope microscope looking at. Yeah. So, yeah. So I look through the microscopes. I like get a soil sample through a process down to uh, about 10 mils 10 milliliters and then I take one mil from that and then I look at that under a microscope and then we just use a multiplication factor to figure Mm. out okay this is how many plant parasitic nematodes you have in 250 grams of soil and Mm. then we can multiply that out to an entire vineyard or yeah an area that's under pressure that we think is nematode pressure we can kind of evaluate it and see okay what are the actual population levels there. So what do these bugs look like? Like what, what's yeah, the shape? Yeah, they look like little worms. I mean, they yeah, they're okay. microscopic. My like spiel when I go into presentations is okay. A nematode is a microscopic roundworm and lives mm. in the soil. Blah blah blah. So they look like little worms. And they chew on the roots or um yes, some of them do. The plant parasitic ones, they or the root not nematodes, the ones I'm working with, they those specific ones I'm working with, they can move through the soil when they're juveniles and they're kind of like poking and prodding around in the roots until they find one that they like. And then they establish a feeding site and then they establish reproduction site actually in the cells of the root themselves. So, I mean, you think of how tiny root hairs and fine root tips are and then something actually has to get into the cells of those. So they are microscopic, but they're not almost invisible. So... Yeah. So and again, they're messing with my wine. So yeah. So you should care about them. Yeah. (laughs) So talk about what these are. Wine grapes. Yep. Right Mm -hmm. behind us. Tell tell us about what these are. Chardonnay. So this is our for my the lab I'm a part of the lab I work in here at WSU um, Prosser IREC. Um, So I work for Dr. Michelle Moyer. She's the Washington State a Viticulture Extension Specialist. So mm. she's like one of one persons in the whole state. So yeah. I get to work for her. I've worked for her for two years as a grad student now, and I did a year of undergrad in her lab, and that kind of convinced me to stay on for a PhD. So yeah. here I am. So this is her research vineyard. So this vineyard, we have like cover crop trials running right now. We have powder mildew r- trials running right now. Um, some you know, trunk disease trial. So this one is a little crazier than you would mm. see like a commercial yeah. um, vineyard, but we induce for some pest pressure here because yeah. we want to have something we can evaluate on. Yeah. So, so these, yeah. these uh, wine grapes, these plants get a little bit more beat up. They get a little they less have, love than yeah. they, than some of the others. Yeah. Just to see what happens. Yep. Absolutely. But I mean, we do, we come through, we hand prune everything. We add nutrients, you know, we just replace all the irrigation in here this year. So like we make sure they're, they're okay. <laughs> We're not just like, eh, we don't got to worry about them. Um, but yeah, 
they look a little more wild than something typical, but we want that. So when other yeah. people come in here and they're like, ooh, we're like, ooh, yes, this yeah. is good for us. So how did you get into this? How do you start in this world of farming, not farming, farming and research <laughs> yeah. and science and then wine and wine grapes in particular? Yeah, um, I have a very non-traditional route into education in general. Um, so I had no idea really what I wanted to do when I graduated high school. I thought maybe dental hygiene. Um, obviously, okay. I'm not in dental oh. hygiene. <laughs> um, so I did a year-ish of community college, and I, I was taking, like, the most random classes at the same time. I had political science of the Middle East and North Africa <laughs> My English class was based on Celtic literature, and I was taking Japanese. And my advisor was like, what are you doing? I was like, trying to find something that interests me. Yeah. And I quickly ran out of money. Um, and so I joined the Marine Corps. So I spent five years in the Marine Corps hoping. Wow. I mean, serving my country was obviously something I wanted to do. I don't think you'd join the Marine Corps just to go to school. Right. Um, there's easier ways to get an education. Yeah. But... Um, so, yeah, I joined the Marine Corps when I was 19. I spent five years in the Marine Corps, two years in Japan, six months in Virginia, another, like, two and a half years in California where I was on a Navy ship for seven months. Um, and then I was like, all right, I'm going to do nursing. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do nursing. So I got out of the Marine Corps. I was applying for nursing school. So I was, like, finishing my last couple prereqs, and I was like, this isn't what I want to do. Yeah. And I had this whole quarter life crisis at 25 just panicking because I was like I didn't want to do dental hygiene now I don't want to do nursing and I googled plant science degrees in Washington state and I saw the viticulture and enology program in WSU why did you search that yeah um well I grew up in a boy scout like centered family yeah. I'm the only girl I have two brothers they're both eagle scouts my dad was a scout master so I grew up with a love of the outdoors yeah and I just had roses that I kept when I was a little kid that I kept alive and I was really good at keeping roses alive I was like seven years old and I had small little backyard garden so I thought well I like plants I have a green thumb this could be cool. And I remembered a kid on the bus in high school had talked about going to school for wine. And I was like, you're 15. You don't, how do you know this? Where did you go to high school? Yeah, Monroe High School. So I'm from Western Washington. See, so I, can, I would expect, region. yeah, I would <laughs> I expect a kid in the wine region maybe, oh, because their dad's a wine grape grower or something like that. Yeah, no. Nope. But no. So I know. So oh, huh. very random. And it all just lined up for me eventually so I remembered oh yeah WCU has this wine or viticulture program and then I it came up on my google search I came out here in July of 2017 and I was starting classes in August of 2017 so I just like up and moved out here from western Washington so I started in 2017 and, and pretty much immediately I knew okay this is where I was meant to be I love it I've really early on established, okay, I want to be on the vineyard side of things. My goal is to be a vineyard manager. Mm -hmm. I know I don't need a PhD for that, but I really care about the research I'm doing. Yeah. Um, I wanted to get a master's degree because I'm a first generation student. I didn't ever really think I would get a bachelor's degree. Like mm -hmm. I knew I would have the opportunity after the Marine Corps, but it just never seemed obtainable. And then yeah. I got a bachelor's degree. And so I wanted a master's degree because I was like, well, I'm here. I still have some of my GI Bill left. There's no reason to not continue. Yeah. And then I got sucked in and I really care about the research I'm doing. And, you know, these, the systems and everything I'm working with, they apply to agriculture as a whole, not just viticulture specifically. Like yeah, my research is vitical, viticulture specifically, but the, the stuff I'm working with, you know, it could go into other systems too. So I stayed for a PhD and I plan to be a vineyard manager with a PhD and, so, yeah, Dr. Gagne someday. But, um, yeah, I just want to farm grape, wine grapes in Washington State. So, yeah. What do you, <laughs> are you just going to find a, a vineyard that's in need of a manager? Or you have visions of starting your own? Um, I don't. I've never really wanted to start my own. Um, I don't know why. That's just never been 
something I've aspired to. Um, I I want to manage vineyard. I want to be the vineyard manager for someone else. Um, I think the business aspect of things kind of is scary for me, a little daunting. So I would rather just focus solely on the growing yeah. instead of all the other things that go along with it. Um, well, not that go along with it, but the other side of things. Um, so yeah, I have worked in, I've kind of like bulldozed my way into the industry. Like I just <laughs> like forced my way into some internships and then, you know, I still spend a few hours here and there working with the vineyard I worked at a few years ago um, because I just don't leave and I just kind of like, hey, I'm here. Um, so find something for me to do. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I've worked several places in a short amount of time and I have really good relationships with a lot of growers because I... I'm curious. I work hard and I care about this industry yeah. a lot. So, yeah. What what is it like? What is it like working with wine grape growers? What what kind of people are they? I I mean, very salt of the earth, you know, people in general. They're just this community I really love, the industry I love because I feel like everybody is there with a helping hand. Mm. You know, it's farming, even, you know, something with a glamorous product like wine. Farming is still hard. Farming is still a struggle. And it's very few and far between where you find somebody who isn't willing to help out. So yeah. I really love the community of people that just support each other and kind of lift each other up. So that is something I loved and, you know, reminiscent of camaraderie in the Marine Corps. Yeah. So, uh yeah, that's a huge attraction for me is that I just love the community here. And I I think it's so cool to see somebody grow the same grapes totally different from somebody else. And then it comes out as a as a amazing product that is can be different vintage to vintage and site yeah. to site. And I just think it's really cool to see if you care about it, if you're passionate about it, the product that can come from it. So, yeah. What do they think of what you're doing, though? Are they like, hmm, you know, new ways of doing things? I don't know. Or they, you know, are growers, wine grape growers here in Washington State open to that kind of like think outside of the box stuff? So far, I've gotten really good reception from the research I'm doing or to yeah. the research I'm doing. Um, you know, people are interested in it because mine is so applied. You know, it's not like, hey, this super expensive equipment or these crazy uh, technologies we're going to bring in and retrofit a vineyard and all these things like mine is like, okay, well, your this is something that is meant to help the system you have in place. Um, so I've had really good feedback and response from growers. Um, I've had people ask me a lot of questions about it. Um, and like some of this isn't new. It's just using technology techniques that we already have and kind of fine tuning them, you know, like, okay, we know that there's some potential with biofumigants and green manure, but do we know like how it works how deep do some of those um, compounds actually go in the soil can we improve this process a little bit to get a better efficacy from this so it's it's i'm not forcing totally new yeah. and abstract you know op opinions and ideas on them it's taking something that's familiar and just trying to come up with a better outcome so so you said biofumigants yeah. that sounds scary you said green manure. That just kind of sounds gross. Right. What, what, what are you actually talking about? And they're here? not like scary or gross. <laughs> it's great. Um, so that's working with um, brassica. So like mustard type crops or even types of radishes that have certain compounds that are toxic to some plant parasitic nematodes in the soil. And you can incorporate those and see how far those compounds will kind of leach or soak into the soil. And, mm. you know, hopefully that will have some nematode reduction Um potential there um so that's like that's some of the research i'm working with is trying some of these crops that we you know have been around people have been using them but is there a process we can kind of tweak a little and see if we can get a little bit better efficacy out of it so or make it just easier for for farmers to use yeah because i know growing up in the farming community that kind of stuff has been talked about but it's always yeah. like yeah but it doesn't really work very right. good but is there that secret thing that if you just do it at the right time or the right amount or exactly one small thing could it make it a real contender for like you were explaining earlier replacing different kinds of chemicals and yep. things that people would rather not use yeah and these things take time and they just take research and they take you know years of data collection and 
So that's where, you know, we come in on this research side of things like, okay, well, this has all been done. Now let's try it this way. And maybe, you know, one day we're going to come upon the like secret ingredient or that, you know, that we're going to. Well, it's happened before. Yeah, absolutely. With different things. Yeah. And I'm working with one crop that's more of a fumigation replacement. Um, So it's a solanaceous crop. It's called lychee tomato. Um, Is it actually a tomato? Yeah, like a kind of, yeah, kind of weird tomato. It's like if a spiky tomatillo and a tomato and weirdly a pie cherry had a baby. Yeah. Crazy. I can know. You, can you eat them? You can. They're not really good, but people like make pies out of them, which Crazy. is weird because they kind of taste like a pie cherry. So. But you grow you put, grow those in the ground because of what they do to the bugs in the dirt. Yep. So that that's like my fumigation uh, replacement crop. So I'm working with that um, to see if it can replace the fumigation chemicals that are like currently the standard for you know reducing nematodes in a replant or preplant vineyard scenarios. So yeah, so they have like a certain root exudate that calls it causes flash flash hatching in mm. root knot nematodes, and then they're a non-host for them, so they can't actually feed on those roots. So we've seen after you know a season of observing and data collection, we've seen some really uh, encouraging results in mm. that. And that wasn't using chemicals; that was using a plant, you know. And they've done research on this um, in potato for pale cyst and golden cyst nematodes. So, yeah, it's just like, okay, so that isn't new technology. We're not creating anything new. It's just kind of expanding that and seeing does it work on another pest. It's similar, you know, it's another soil bo- soil-borne plant parasitic nematode. Now can we take this research that's been done in potato and apply it to grapes? And so now after grapes, maybe it can be used in another crop after that. So, yeah, yeah stuff like that is really cool. And it's really encouraging to get good results. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah that, that's a fun project to work on and, and really cool to see the potential it has. What does your family think of all of this? Yeah, well... I, like I said, I'm first generation student, so um, education was never like a priority for my yeah. family. So at first, it was kind of, oh, is anything going to come from this? Yeah. And now there's a lot more support and intrigue and interest because uh, it is one, it's so applied. I think my family thought of education as more traditional, like you're in school for four years and then you sit at a desk for the rest of your life. And I'm like, this is the opposite of that. I'm in school for like eight years now and then I (laughs) hopefully won't be at a desk for the rest of my life. Um, But yeah, there, I mean, it's so crazy. My family is, I'm like first generation farmer, if you will. Um, You know, nobody in my family ever talked about farming, anything like that. But then recently my dad just told me my great grandpa lived in Prosser and got an award for the most potatoes grown per acre in the Great Depression, which I was like... So you never knew, and now you're here in Prosser. Yeah, and I didn't even know really that my family lit my, like, my ancestors ever really lived in Prosser, and I just found this out, and I was like, Dad, you should have told me this when I was an undergrad, because I could have gotten <laughs> way more scholarships. <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, farming is in my blood, but then for two generations... There was no farming, yeah. and it wasn't even talked about. I didn't even know about it, and now here I am, you know, in Prosser, in farming, and it blows my mind that I'm here, and I was like, well, some things are just meant to be. Yeah, so I totally. think um, in the going back to my roots I didn't even know existed aspect, it's pretty cool for my family to see that. And then also I I just love that I get to kind of change the narrative of what they thought education was. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, to be a first-generation student – with a PhD someday, fingers crossed. I mean, that's, I didn't ever think that would be me. And now I'm halfway through this journey. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. Like what kind of stuff do you, your parents do? Yeah. My, so my mom, um, she was a stay at home mom. I was actually homeschooled for a huge chunk of my oh. childhood. Um, so stay at home mom. And now maybe she still works for the school district, but she's like mm. a paraeducator for yeah. many years after we all, uh, left left home like one of my older brother was also in the marine corps marine corps reserves but he left home and then my little brother now lives in colorado so Mm. we all left home and so my mom went and was a paraeducator and my dad has worked um at boeing for as long as i can remember and he's actually 
started in asbestos removal of all things, and now oh, wow. it's now I think his term his title is general analyst for for Boeing. So Crazy. not at all farming, and yeah, I have a lot of dentists and dental hygienists <laughs> in my family, which is where I was like, oh. I'll carry on the family <laughs> tradition, not knowing I would carry on a family tradition yeah. I didn't even know existed. Totally so. different one. Yeah. So having come from Western Washington mm-hmm. and growing up, really, I mean, what you're describing is a pretty average Western Washington kind of family. Like dad works at Boeing, right. and, you <laughs> know, know, blue collar, but not totally and not farming. Mm-hmm. And, you know, now coming over here, Yep. as you said, I think this was your word, bulldozing your way (laughs) into the world of vineyards and wine. Yeah. What would your message back to those of us in Western Washington be about what this world is like out here? I think it's just so different than what I thought it was growing up. Mm -hmm. You know, I just was like, well, there's nothing over there. And then everything we have, not everything, a huge portion of the commodities we have in Western Washington comes from Eastern Washington. And I don't think I realized that growing up. I don't think I knew about it. You know, even as a young adult, I, I didn't really realize it. So I just, there is so much more to this world, to the side of the state than what we know about on the West side or what is, you know, shown. When I say now, when I say, Oh, I'm from Washington state, people always are like, Oh, Seattle. And I'm like, okay, three hours east of Seattle. Um, so yeah, there's just so much more out here than I think anybody could ever realize unless they really came out here and really took a look at all the different commodity crops grown out here. I mean, we have the world's largest, uh, like plantings of hops. So, I mean, the world's, I think we're, I'm pretty sure, pretty sure we're even bigger than, um, Germany now. So it's just, you know, we have, we, produce some impressive crops out here and just to not really know about that growing up on the west side is yeah. is kind of mind-blowing it makes me a little sad yeah um but really grateful that i i landed here and i i kind of figured my way out to be here and to actually appreciate it so yeah. and what about like how farming works too for people in western washington like there's a lot of misunderstandings and there's mm-hmm. You know, it's talked about a lot from both sides. Like there's this big disconnect between farmers and eaters and people who live in cities and eat the food that farmers produce. And, you know, people in the city want to know more, but how do they? How do they actually get on a farm and see all that stuff? What's your message to them? Like coming from that world to this, what have you learned? Um, I think, you know, I think social media is really – can be a really useful tool. So if you find a farmer, you find a crop or grower, somebody that interests you on social media, like now you have this opportunity, you could reach out to them. And it's very rarely will there be a farmer who is like, I don't want to talk to you. I don't, I don't want to tell you about my story or what it is because farmers and the majority of, you know, the the farmers out here are families, are people. Some of the big farmers out here still, you know, they'll still be family owned and operated yeah. for generations, but they're now they're huge, but they're still a family at the core of that. You know, we're people. We are, I mean, some of us are city people that made it out yeah. here and, and stayed. So I think if you reach out, if you explore a little, if you get out of your own comfort zone just a little, you know, it's, there's, really not going to be anybody that like shuts the door in your face and if if somebody does then just turn around try again there's going to be somebody who wants to talk to you so badly and just to show this side of you know the state and this this little bit of the world so so how soon do we get to you know come out and visit you and i think we need we need to have a a follow-up once you're a vineyard manager and see what's going on Oof. Okay. Well, as I said, I'm a grad student going for my PhD. So (laughs) I am not yet a PhD candidate. Hopefully in November, I'll be a PhD candidate. And then that will give me like two and a half years left of school, which seems like a really long time. But when you've been in school this long, it seems like a really short amount of time. Yeah. So yeah. So hopefully in November, I pass my preliminary exams and then I'll be a PhD candidate. And then I'll be, you'll see me at some grower conferences. You'll see, start to see maybe a publication here or there. You'll see some research posters that I'm doing. 
Um, and I love talking about the work that I'm doing. So the more opportunities I have for that, I jump on them. So, yeah, so ho- hopefully, you know, give or take three years, hopefully the shorter side of three years, I'll be, yeah, a doctor out there as a vineyard manager somewhere in Washington State. So that's the goal. Well, thanks for having us out here to the research yeah. station facility, whatever. <laughs> it's bigger than that. It's huge, yeah. all these fields and everything out here and yeah. in the wine grapes Absolutely. right here. Absolutely. I'm really glad you could come out and see it. Yeah. It's, it's a really cool, interesting little research station, little big research station. Yeah. So I'm really glad you got to come out and see it. And thanks for sharing your story too. Absolutely. This is awesome. And I'm serious. I, I think we're going to have to follow up with this. Cool. Well, yeah, I'll be around. I plan to stay in Washington State, so I won't be too hard to find. And yeah, thank you again for having me. It was really great. This is the Real Food, Real People podcast. These are the stories of the people who grow your food. 